Hey, Graham, are you there? It's Mark here. Yep. Um, so I, I'm going to have to get my head around this technical stuff, but um, before before my cause enable folder disappears, because to be honest, they were talking about that having a finite lifespan. Sorry, my team's just dropped up just in just just at the wrong moment there. Oh, <laughs> Not no. again. Um, before my uh, cause enabled folder uh, expires, because they were talking about that just having a, a finite lifespan uh, okay. from yep. the data point of view more than anything. Um, one, I need to export my annotations, but perhaps this is something the um, image annotations group should do to make sure that everybody has a good idea of the workflow needed to archive these types of things, the, the annotations and a way of linking them to the images, which can then be shared. So yep, yep. And, and that's not obvious, bit, not obvious to me how that happens. Moment. Yeah, right, there isn't. There we are. Okay. <laughs> so that's what we're, we're trying to work on. It, yep. it, this way, it's really starting from the beginning. Um, that yep. trying to take these annotations out, put you know, store them and manage them somewhere properly, as it were, and it, and ensure that they can then become true data, you know, as it, as it were, and, and and move onward. Yeah. So when when the lady from FathomNet was actually talking about annotated images, she was basically meaning images with a bit of text associated with them telling you what they are. That's really what she means, isn't it? We're, she's not talking about annotations in the Beagle context where they are a discrete block uh, of pixels with yeah. a discrete I, label tree annotation pegged to them. I think she's probably just saying this image needs to have somewhere in it in the text or somewhere that says this is an image of X taxon unit. So, so I, I missed the first half of that because I was in a, a, a lovely another meeting at the same time. Um, but I, th I think there's two. I think there is the image level annotation, which is almost metadata. Um, not to mention that word. Um, but um, and, but there was the other aspect of, in effect, giving them a. I don't know if you use the word region or bounding box, um, on, on an image, which um, and that bounding box specifically relates to a specific concept. Um, so that's more like the annotation. It's not quite to the level of Beagle where you can do proper any type of geometry. It's limited to a X, Y extent bounding box. Um, but I think there's that concept there as well. It might be that the, the export from the yeah, Beagle annotations will have exports. some sort of bounding box in it, won't it? Or perhaps could easily be converted into a bounding box, you know, just taking maximum top left bottom right corner or something like that mm -hmm. yeah yeah so so, and that, 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 so that's why um or are we talking bounded box geographically here no 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 you can uh, no, I'm, I'm gonna force close hank's screen don't worry <laughs> um mark what there you were go. just the, what you're just referring to in the beagle output is really easy to backwards generate especially if you're using polygons yeah, yeah. Not if you're going to use points, so that's actually a, 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 a chat that I had with a few colleagues yesterday. Is there's a uh, quite rightly a lot of the um, annotation currently is done using point data, and point data you cannot get an extent out of. Um, Beagle sometimes actually does quite a nice, good estimate when it's using its um, um, overview, but you yeah you can't get an extent. So that that sort of drives towards at least using <laughs> circles or bounding boxes. <laughs> to annotate single things for rather than the point tool. The other thing Beagle obviously has built in the background somewhere, when you, when you use the Largo tool or any of those sort of QA features, it doesn't bring up just the polygon. It brings up a bounded area to give you some little bit of context around the point or the polygon that you've actually annotated. And, you know, that would be almost the ideal, I would have thought, that little box. Yeah, it's a bit you're... weird. I can't. We haven't worked out quite what it's doing with a few of those like semi-automated black box bits. Because with the lasers, for instance, um, when you're using an air automated laser detection, um, it's very, very pernickety over basically which pixel within the area of the laser that you click on. If that makes right. sense. Yeah. We've yeah. had a lot of problems where the laser detection is failing miserably. Where um, where effectively the actual absolute centre of your laser point is a complete burnt out 
white, so there is uh, no data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. White. What it, so yeah. in that in that scenario, what we've worked, at, what you, it suddenly becomes really obvious when you think about it. If it's not taking in a bounding box of an average pixel color across the whole area of the laser point, and you accidentally click on the white pixel, not the mm -hmm. green pixel or the red pixel, you get nothing. Yeah, so yeah. in some of those black box tools and we haven't i don't think with the lasers we've actually talked to them about that yet because we're trying to take that out into a into a python script anyway so it's kind of yeah. slightly by the by but um yeah it's a, it's a bit ambiguous at the moment with some of those different tools whether it's using sort of an average pixel across an x you know a certain area or whether it's just using especially with points the pixel you've clicked on mm. um, it might be worthwhile speaking with jen because i assume it's probably using maya or, yeah or i don't know anything to that so she, she might know. yeah um, but no, def a lot of those things all make all in the back of my head make me think. Right, okay, we need to stop just just been using points as you were yeah. saying yesterday, Mark. Yeah, I think we came to that as we did it. We came to that conclusion because it just seemed like, yeah, even if we just use the brush tool, we we just got more information to go on if we need it. Um, yep. And maybe we don't need it at the moment, but it it's um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we did we did that. I, I pushed. I went down that route with some unicellar stuff we were doing. Um, I should. I, had, I, know, I don't remember if I ever sent that to you, Mark. I should have done. Um, it was all done in such a hurry. But um, yeah, just using the lines. Um, so instead of just sticking a dot on on a on a fan to count it, stick a line across it because in the hope that one day we can work out how to backwards convert a line of sort of maximum dimension or whatever into some sort of some sort of useful measure. Because as you say, you don't lose anything by drawing lines and just counting lines as one, two, three, four for now. But what you've also got is some sort of dimension measure that later you might be able to come back to and do something clever with. Yeah, and to start with, I poo pooed that idea and I thought well, that's going to be really inaccurate. But actually, who cares? And it will answer the question. Are there lots of little things? Yeah, are there a yeah. whole mix of size yeah. ranges or are there just a few big things? And yeah. at that level, it absolutely works. And who cares if it's not an, a perfect estimate of biomass that, that really that, is by the by so well that was exactly what i that was exactly I'll, I'll dig it out and send you the, the the rationale document i ended up writing but that was exactly my point it was like forget about trying to put these things into necessarily meaningful classes except that it's arbitrary and accept that it's just bin size bin bin classes yeah but from that you can at least as long as you're consistent yeah. you can still you can still do something with that or you can do more than you can just with um just with a number of points and that's the danger with it there isn't it is that you've got to make sure that everybody is annotating like similarly but it's yeah. a step in the right direction to just having an image with kind of an idea of what's in it but no kind of location for what somebody called that thing in the image but it's again there's so much variability even in Biggle like we've been when we've been using it there's so many differences in how people use it just between different people using yeah. it different I mean, ways so and having preference for different tools you know it's yeah it's, there's a standardization thing that needs to happen with actually how you annotate as well, I think, to some degree in the future. Oh, absolutely. But that, that comes back to. Um... I, I wonder if it matters all that much when you actually think about the really big questions that if you were going to put all these projects together. You know, it's say at a UK level, there'd be a huge amount of standardization anyway, and I bet, you know, it, it would it would make people skin crawl thinking about all these different ways it's happened. But actually, when you did the analysis, I bet it make bugger all difference. <laughs> compare it to compare it to the amount of natural noise that's out there anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. And to get all those data sets together, you are going to be making some horrendous standardizations, probably. Hopefully at the end of this, a lot less horrendous standardizations than it will actually be possible. But um, they'll still be you know a load of truncation needed and yeah and it's big questions you're going to be asking of it it's not minute questions if it was minute questions you'd have to design an entirely different whole you know experimental design and you wouldn't be working um probably just on a, a random set of images from whatever you could gather i better go and get a cup of coffee anyway <laughs> um, i'm going to um I'm going to investigate with FathomNet. Um, I, I, it's really how I, because I'm not going to be able to keep these images where they are now. So I'm going to have to find a, I want to be able to put the images and the annotations together or somehow link them and um, and make sure the work's not lost. Really. Well, for the, for the images, for the images, it's worthwhile chatting with Dan Lear from Dash because that's something they, I mean, the archiving of images is strictly within their remit. 
Um, so welcome to session five, everyone, where we're focusing on training, standards and acquisition approaches for the future. Um, with the project working groups involved being for training approaches, workflow guidance, and then also the tech reviews, which isn't strictly speaking a formal project working group. Um, so Henk is pre presenting on behalf of the uh, Action Plan Coordination Committee. So yeah, we've got three speakers in this session. We've got Jamie Davis from the University of Plymouth, who is a deep sea ecologist who's been working on benthic imagery data for over 15 years. And um, she's working with taxonomists, combining taxonomy uh, with imagery to allow for more robust taxa identification for reference collections and training material. Uh, and she'll be giving us a background on the training working group, as well as the work that the University of Plymouth have been doing in this area. Uh, up next, we'll have Ross Bullimore from CFAS, the Centre for uh, Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science. Um, he is the lead for surveys, data acquisition and sample processing with a background in shallow slash coastal epifauna and benthic surveys, in, in situ and remote imaging, Im yeah. imaging techniques. <laughs> Um, and he'll be providing us with an overview of how they're planning to tackle the benthic imagery workflow guidance tasks. Uh, and then finally, we'll have Henk, who I'm sure at this point needs no introduction, <laughs> um, marine ecologist from JNCC, who's been working for the past two years to bring us all together um, and form the UK's benthic imagery action plan and the big picture group. And he'll be talking us through the technology reviews. Um, so yeah, if Kerry is able to share her screen on behalf of Jamie. Lovely. Thank you, Kerry. Honestly, it could only happen to me. It's typical. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to give an overview of um, the Benthic Imagery Analysis Training Scheme Working Group, or the Training Working Group, as I call it for short. Um, we haven't had our scoping meeting yet. Um, so I was going to give an introduction to what the working group is and then kind of give a perspective of what we've been doing in Plymouth because we've been working on deep sea um, training components for quite a long time. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick overview. Um, the tasks that are in the training working group are part of the, the wider training quality assurance theme which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and the main tasks of this theme are training for imagery analysts and assessing their work to ensure standards are met. So um, just an overview of what those tasks compile of. It's um, training methods to be reviewed, gaps and targets identified, and a large range of new courses, workshops and resources are proposed, including developing a centre of excellence for benthic taxonomy in the UK. Next slide, please. So this is the um, Benthic Imagery Action Plan flowchart, which Hank introduced us to on Tuesday, I think it was. Um, and on the right hand side, if you just um, arrow down, please, Kes, thanks. Um, this is the circle here shows the um, training and quality assurance theme. And then if we look at the next slide, you can see the boxes in red are the nine tasks that are part of this um, training working group. And if we look onto the next slide, you can see here that I've um, pulled out those nine different tasks. And if we look at the blue highlighted boxes, you can see that um, four of them. So, yeah, thanks, Kaz. Um, four of them are kind of what we were discussing in the meeting that we had in November. Um, and they were mostly around the more um, immediate needs that we need for training. So if we look at um, 72, this is developing online imagery identification tool. 75 is reviewing analysis training approaches um, and then potentially having workshops to help develop these. 78 is developing new training courses and materials. And then 87 would be developing online training modules. So I kind of see the working group as, you know, more you know, these tasks to what we need right now, and then some of the other tasks like developing the center of excellence of taxonomy and having standards and accreditation schemes are gonna be further down the line when some of the other working groups feed into our working group. You know, they're all very much interlinked. So if we look at the um, next slide, as I said, um, we haven't had our scoping meeting yet. Um, 
and I was going to arrange it for just before this meeting, but I thought, well, actually, it's probably more beneficial to have our working group meeting after this, because then we can kind of see how all the other different working groups feed into our working group. Um, I can introduce people to the, what we've been doing. I'm not necessarily saying that's what everybody should do, but, you know, we have been working on this for some time. So we'll have our scoping meeting um, later this month. Um, and I think this three day workshop will really help kind of um, target what we want to tackle over the next year or so. So I thought I'd kind of go into the evolution of the Smarter ID project. And I'm sure many of you heard Kerry and I talk about this. Um, so um, if we look at the first bit in 2005, we started our first species catalogue. And this was when we were involved in the SEA work um, with DEFRA and we were working off Scotland, looking at various deep sea features. And we kind of realized that we needed some kind of reference catalog because we were looking at lots of different areas, you know, collecting a lot of imagery. So we started doing this in-house catalog where we would go through all the new imagery collected. We would take an example image and this wouldn't just be the beautiful version of it. It would be, you know, representation of good and bad. Um, we used OTU numbers. Um, and if we look at the next bit, Kerry. So the way we had it is it was built taxonomically, um, so a folder structure, and within each folder that would be broken down by either taxonomy, particularly for the you know the corals, the echinoderms, but then for the sponges we used morphotype because that made a lot more sense. So we did combine early on morphology with the taxonomy. Um, and you can see on the right hand side that within each of those folders, um, that's it. So this is an example of what the C pens look like. So you can see there's lots of example images. Sometimes there's more than one example images per OTU. Um, and this just shows that, you know, we have an example, we have the OTU number. But if we look down at the bottom, we also have an underlying database as well. So this, you know, sits underneath it. This is a um, access database. If we can just arrow down, please, Kerry. Thank you. Um, you know, and this has what the OTU number is, all the taxonomic information. So from file of the whole way down. So, you know, it means that we have this consistency with our data set. So from 2005, all the data sets that Plymouth have worked on have used this um, OTU system. But obviously it is still linked with taxonomy. We still use, you know, the nomenclature, which um, Tammy Horton's paper has just been published on, you know, not consistently in some places we need to add that in. But, you know, we have been using as much taxonomy as we can. Um, we often work with um, experts in the field, taxonomists, to get identifications checked, um, you know, making sure we're including all that. So, you know, just uh, the importance of this, and I think we've touched on this, for monitoring particularly, we need these consistent IDs. And all of the work that we've done for JNCC since, you know, back in the day, quite a long time now, which has fed into their um, MPA work, has all been using the same identification scheme. So all of that data is comparable, it could all be combined. And for monitoring purposes, we can go back and we can be confident, you know, that we're looking at the same taxa as we saw before. So moving along the um, timeline to 2010. Um, so at this point, we decided to put the species catalogue online um, and many other institutes have been using this. And obviously it's been developing over time. And then if we jump forward to 2012, we organised our first Coral ID workshop where we worked with taxonomists bringing together you know, traditional tax on, on me with imagery data, because this is what we're trying to do with um, Smarter ID. Then in 2017, we had an international workshop and obviously Kerry Howell's been leading the Smarter ID work. So we had this workshop in 2017. It was international, so we had lots of different institutes there. So representation from NOAA, Ephraimair, Knox, lots of different places. Um, at the same time, we had another Coral ID workshop as well, where we obviously progressed from the first one. Um, and then off the back of this work in 2017, this was where, you know, it was really, I can't even remember, was it a two-day workshop, I think, you know, it was discussed about what the underlying database structure would be for Smarter ID, making sure, you know, it was Darwin core, so it was compatible with OBIS and everything else. And, you know, there's a lot of detail. This is, you know, Kerry's she, she really does love this database structure and you know she went heavily into this just to make sure it had all the information we needed it would be compatible um, and then in 2019 Kerry led on the paper which published the outline of the Smarter ID structure um, 
And since then, we've been working together with the other institutes and they've been submitting submitting imagery so that we can try and merge all these different in-house catalogues or if they don't have catalogues, they just have images. So in 2021, where we are now, um, we are in the process of getting ready to launch um, the Smarter ID web tool. So the developers are working on this and we should have a beta version ready quite soon, um, which will be great for people to try. And then if we look at the next slide, just kind of give you a concept of what Smarter ID as in how you submit in images and how it would work. So um, for the Corals, the group that I'm leading, um, we've had nine organisations covering North Atlantic fauna submitting data. So Eframare, Guardline, Knox, Nowhere, various other ones as well, I've probably forgot. And, you know, they're all submitted in different ways. And I've used these just as an example. So the three images on the left, so, you know, three CPEN images, you know, this isn't what's happened, but just to give it a simple um, explanation of, you know, they could have all been submitted as Panacula, but they're not all the same thing. And we kind of need to know that. So we have these teams of um, taxon specific experts that go through the imagery that's been submitted and discuss, you know, how are we going to merge these data sets? You know, what are the limitations of the identification of certain taxa? You know, at what point do we need to stop? Um, so, you know, when that process has gone through, we're obviously incorporating taxonomy with the morphotypes, which is particularly important for stuff like the sponges. And then we come up with a standardised um, identification. All the metadata behind everyone's submitted data will be merged as well. And this is what will feed into the Smarter ID tool. So on the right, just an example of, you know, the two top ones, actually, they're not Panacula anymore. They're Tyella. Um, they are two different species, but the experts might say, well, actually, you can't consistently tell them apart, so we'll merge them as one type and put spur to let you know there's more than one species in there. And the third one is actually Panacula phosphorea. So it just means that across the North Atlantic, you know, if we can all use the same identification tools, then we're all calling the same things the same things. And it just means it gives us a lot more robustness with our data. And just down the bottom there, that's the paper that um, we published in 2019. So the next slide, this is a um, figure that I took from the um, Smart ID paper, and it just kind of shows, and I'll go through this really quickly, but it just kind of shows on the bottom left, you know, we this is the process where we review the imagery, the team goes through it, um, they decide has it been identified correctly and how does it fit in with the other imagery that we have. Then this obviously goes through quality control, um, so the images can be merged with a main database. Then if we move up to the web interface, um, on the web interface, people can then obviously submit new imagery and then it goes back through a loop. This has to go back through the um, review process, quality control, back to the web. So you can't just upload directly. It has to go back through this quality control process. And then from the web interface, you know, this all came from the, the meeting that we had in 2017. You know, it could be that you want to um, have an e-guide, like an app, so we could link to that or we could link it to a reference annotation scheme. So Beagle is the obvious one, which is what we use. Or it could be that you're going to see and you want to download a photo ID book. So that could be you want to download everything or you want to filter. So we'll have filters based on um, Phyla or it could be, um, there'll be Kantami classification in there as well. So you can filter it by whatever you need, basically. Um, and just a word on the Katami, we are using this system now, but we've discussed this a lot that it doesn't work for everything. So we are trying to um, rectify this as we go through as well. I know Kerry has been working on the um, Ophiroids from Katami point of view, and we're looking at um, the black corals as well with one of the coral taxonomists, how we can use colony growth forms um, to kind of give greater information because Katami puts black corals and Gorgonians together, which isn't particularly helpful because they're both BME indicator species. So you kind of need a high resolution of data in there. So we are working on those things as well. Um, so if we just have a quick look at the next slide. So this is kind of um, what we're doing, what we have been doing and what we're currently doing and what we plan to do training in the University of Plymouth. So first of all, annotation software. Um, you know, everyone's been talking about this and Neil mentioned this yesterday, which is a really good point, actually. You know, being able to use the annotation software correctly is super important, actually. And the way I learned how to use Beagle was 
kind of making quite a lot of mistakes, actually. I think everyone's probably on the same page. You learn how to use it by how not to use it. Um, so I think we need that information um, disseminated. So we're currently putting a training manual together from, you know, all the way back to how to set up a remote server, how to bring your data in, you know, how to set up label trees, but how to add to your label trees as you go on. Um, and, you know, just a lot of useful tips, which I think will be useful. And we're also trialing um, a student training session. So we have a joint project with the University of Gibraltar. And we're going to see how we can use, you know, how we can train remotely. I think if this lockdown has taught us anything, it's taught us that we can do a lot remotely, actually. We don't have to be in person for a workshop. So we're trying that through, you know, a combination of traditional lecture format and then using Beagle as the training mechanism um, not just for how to use Beagle, it'll be, you know, how do you sample images? Because obviously in Beagle, there's lots of different images. You can do, you know, random points like was being spoken about yesterday. So we'll train them on all of that. And then um, if we move on to the next bit, the identification skills, you know, obviously that's all going to sit under the Smarter ID umbrella. You know, the Smarter ID is not just an image reference catalogue. It's going to have, if we look down, so the Smarter ID is taking a regional approach to standardised identification. And at the moment, we're working on the North Atlantic, but obviously this could be applied to other regions. We're looking at specifically the deep sea, but this could be adapted to shallow water as well, although I appreciate that would be more difficult. Um, and then <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to have training videos in with this as well to try and help, you know, help with some of that work. Um, training material, which we have been working on, and on the left here, you can see this is one of the diagnostic sheets we put together quite a long time ago now. Um, this was some work that we started with NOAA, and this was, you know, how we can pick out morphological features from imagery, which you can train people on. So then when they're looking at imagery, they kind of know what they're looking for, exactly how you would train somebody in the lab, but applying it to imagery. Um, this work hasn't as progressed as much as we would like because it's impossible to get funding for this stuff. So this is what we've been doing slowly over time. Um, and then we have another pilot student training session. So linked to the Beagle training, we will then also train them on how to identify taxa. And it's not specifically deep sea taxa, um, although we will use those example images because we have a lot and they're really high quality. But it's just generally, can we train students how to identify taxa using imagery? So if you think about the days when you were doing your marine biology degree, for those people who did, you know, you'd be in the lab. That's how we learned. We learned by sifting through dead things. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's very time consuming. Um, but imagery can bring a whole different feel to that. So we're going to kind of, yeah, see if we can work on that a little bit. So that's kind of an update of where we are in Plymouth. Um, we're quite busy and it'd be really interesting for us to feedback how we find the whole Beagle training. So the, um, the student training is later this month, actually. So we can feedback how it went. I'm sure there'll be things that we need to improve. Um, but next steps for the next steps of the working group is we need to have the scoping meeting. So we'll have that later this month. Um, and I think it'll be really good. I do I'm not try to justify why I haven't organised the meeting. I've been too busy. But actually, I think it'll be very beneficial having it after this three day workshop. Um, and if anybody wants to join the working group, obviously email the big picture email and they'll pass it on to me. Um, but I think we can produce a lot of really good things, actually. I think the EIP meeting showed the expertise, the identification expertise that we have in this group. And I think it would be really, really useful to utilise that as much as we can to provide future training needs. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I've just got a few minutes for questions now. Um, before we move on to the next talk and then we'll have the discussion session at the end as we've had with others. Uh, there's been a few things in the chat. So we've got a question. Some of the tasks uh, in, as needed now were initially down as low priority. Does this mean that you're reprioritizing tasks uh, when the working group meets? Um, so, so I kind of looked at that when I put the presentation together. So oh, some of these are low priority. I, I guess the reason why some of them will be taken forward when they're not necessarily high priority is because we're already doing it. And I guess the whole point of the big picture is that, you know, unless we get funding to do some of this, a lot of this will be done on the back of things that are already being done. Um, and because Plymouth, and I'm sure we're not the only ones, I'm sure other people are doing similar things to us or thinking about it. Um, I think for us, 
it was very obvious that, you know, we could actually fill a lot of these needs because we're doing a lot of this anyway. Thank you. Um, we've also got a question. So is the AFIA ID stored uh, in the species data, ta data table? Um, and is a connection maintained with worms to keep the nomenclature uh, up to date? Yeah, yeah. Yes to both. Yeah, yes yeah. Both. No, there's there's been Kerry's done a significant, and she knows far more about this. Um, she's done a significant amount of work to make sure the database structure behind it um, makes every everything you know links up, and it yeah links to worms, so we can keep that. Um, we had a discussion about this the other day, actually. Keep that taxonomic information up to date, and it might be that it updates. We could decide how frequently it will update it, because obviously taxonomy updates all the time. But yeah, all those things are included. Uh, thank you. Um, also, just a flag for anyone that's not seen it in the chat. Um, Jess has put a link into a form which will allow you to submit any questions anonymously. Uh, we'll leave that running all day just if anyone would prefer to ask questions that way. Um, and you can just put in who it's addressed to um, and we'll relay it back to them. Um, oh, we've got another question. Is the Smarter ID open access? Yes. I had to think about that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah, it'll be web-based, but yeah, it'll be open to everybody to use. I mean, the the Howell and Davis version online, although it was updated and I can't remember the year, Kerry, but um, a couple of years back. Yeah, it's always been open access, just needs to be referenced. At, at the moment, Plymouth catalogue is still completely downloadable uh, from the Deep Sea Crew website, and it was updated in 2016. Okay. Um, the Smarter ID catalogue is still not fully functional, but when it when it is launched, it's completely open to anyone who wants to use it. Thanks, Gary. Um, oh, not a question, but a comment from Graham. <laughs> uh, as a non-taxonomist, very much like the idea of in effect standard and consistent OTU lists, from the mapping sides, you work out what something is first or at least that something is different from the other things and only then do you worry about what to call it in whatever classification system you want. This seems very similar unless I have everything completely wrong. I, feel like I, I think might need to read that out again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah probably. Um, I I, yeah, I, I mean, it, it depends, doesn't it? I think sometimes you can go through your imagery, and we do this, we go through our imagery up front. You know, you go to see, you collect a new data set, you go through to see if there's any new tags that you haven't seen before that you need to add to your catalogue. But as you say, sometimes, you know, you know it's different, but you don't know what it is, and you can give it a temporary label. And this is the point of the OTU system, is you can give something an OTU, it doesn't mean you've definitively identified it, you can alter that as you go along. And we do that quite a lot with, Beagle, that's why I love Beagle actually, because the Largo function allows you to say, okay, I know, I don't know what this is. It's a panaculid. I don't know what it is. I'll just label it as this for now. And when I finish my analysis, I'll go through, use the Largo function. You can merge things or you can separate them because I think your opinion on identification evolves through your analysis and what you think at the end is very different. So I use that Largo function. It takes me at least a day to go through my Largo function because I check every single label for mistakes because I've broken my mouse from using it too much in Beagle. But, um, you know, I think that's really important. I think that's why I like Beagle. So, yeah, totally agree with Graham. You don't always need to say what it is up front. Sometimes, you know, those evolve. And um, this is the process that we're going through with Smarter Ideas, checking what people have said things are and saying, actually, do we still agree? You know, it might be that that needs to be adapted. And this is the point of trying to bring all those different data sets together. It gives you that ability to go through that process, which I think a lot of people don't necessarily have the time to do. Um, and I think you do need to do that quite regularly. You have to check in, relook at your um, reference collection. Does anything, do you agree with it anymore? You know, does it need to change? So, yeah, that's a big process of what we'll be doing. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, I'm seeing both Henk and Kerry with hands up. I think it's my team's playing up because it's telling me only one person has their hand up. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll, um, I'm happy to wait after Kerry. I was just gonna kind of comment on on that really, and that that it that whole approach really came from um, 
me being taught taxonomy by Andy Mackey as a polychaete taxonomist. And when I started with Andy Mackey in the museum, <laughs> National Museum of Wales back in 1997 or whenever that was, I think, um, you know, Andy Mackey's approach was exactly that. You know, he'd present you with a whole pot of worms. And I said, oh, Andy, how do I know which ones are what species? Terrified of it uh, as a <laughs> not so long out of degree person. And um, and he just basically said, look, just look at them. Do they look different? Sort them into piles of things that look different. And he goes, and then when you've got them into piles of things that look different, I'll come and have a look at them and tell you what they are. And if and, and he'd come and look at the pile of worms and he'd go, actually, there's two kinds of worms in this one pile. And he'd separate them and then show me why they were should be in two separate piles, you know. So I think part of the OTU system is just trying to um, demystify taxonomy and just get people to think, do these things look different? And if they do look different, I'll give them a different name. And then you can go back and think about, well, what are they called and why are they that? It, it's, it's actually trying to help teach people taxonomy. It's just going about it in a different way, but but a way that I completely, uh, that struck a chord with me when, when Andy Mackey taught me it a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and Hank, did you have anything final to add? Um, yeah, just just um, just to say that I really like this work. That 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 um, I I like the simplicity of the idea, and I think it's something that echoes with all of us. And I really like the backstory that Kerry, um, you know, that Kerry gave uh, gave us there because it makes sense. You you sort like with like really. Um, just to say, also well done, Jamie and Kerry for putting that together, and Kirsten, um, uh, and. Uh, and and my my comment uh, uh, a que a question actually is is I know it's I know it's it's early days for for bringing things together but I I, I have heard a few conversations about this and I'm wondering if you've had any thoughts um, whether or not we could we could we could or whether it would be worth merging thinking about how we could combine um, smarter ID framework. And the epifauna identification pr protocol, um, and maybe sort of some sort of reference training. Well, I mean, you know, that that to become a, a reference training catalog that can make recommendations on what you should call things based on image quality. Do you think? Do you think such a thing like that would be possible, um, kind of in the near future or the further future? I'll let Kerry answer this one because she leads the Smarter ID, so it'd be down to her. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, Hank, I think it's entirely possible. The, 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 um, the issue will be funding, I guess, because it our, our yeah. focus at the moment. So the Smarter ID project at the moment, the website development, and everything is funded by actually the development of a South Atlantic catalogue. <laughs> so wow. we've got. So, so we're developing a South Atlantic version of the same catalogue, um, but that needs the same web front end, and so it's serving everybody. So I think, um, and then the taxonomy training is part of that as well to build capacity in in developing nations, particularly in in identification from imagery. So, so while I think it's absolutely possible, I, I guess it it wouldn't be a priority for us just because we've got these other things that we have to do, but that. But we're totally open to looking at how to do that. And if and if there are things we can do in the development of the web front end that keep that door open, then more yeah. than happy to, to try and do that. So when we get the sort of the, the, the pilot version, which we are expecting imminently, um, it was meant to be due in January, uh, then um, then we can definitely make sure that you know it's we we farm it out to to interested people in this group to see you know what it does and then we can have a think about if there are things we could tweak now that would enable that in the future yeah. then we we can do that for sure great great I, I i like i think we'd all like a link to that once it's out so so, so please do circulate that um when it's ready sure thank you OK, so thank you, Jamie and Kerry. Uh, if anyone does have any further questions, we can bring them up in the discussion session at the end. But for now, we can move on to Ross Bullimore talking about workflow guidance. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, right, 
similar to uh, apology. I'll start with the apologies and then get on to the good stuff. Um, similar to Mark yesterday and Jamie just now. Um, yeah, hands up and complete acknowledgement to everyone I've mentioned on this slide that you haven't heard a peep out of me or this working group or anything. Um, and there we go. I apologise. Um, so we haven't had any. We haven't actually engaged this working group properly yet. Um, and there are some logical reasons to that. Um, I've obviously been discussing stuff very briefly with both Mike Fraser and Nicola. Um, and for the time being today, it's only me that you get to hear from. Sorry about that. Um, and there's, the reason for that is what I want to quickly do today is take the opportunity to basically share with the entire group um, why it was that um, myself and John said to Hank that, that we'd try and co-lead this working group in the first place. Um, so we'll get on to that, but firstly, just to introduce the working group, just, for, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm heartened over the last couple of days that without talking to each other, we've all started our presentations almost in exactly the same way. Um, so where, where this working group lives in the, um, in the whole structure um, is in the little red box uh, and inside the little red box, um, the selection of tasks that particularly are focused upon this working group. As per Jamie, I've pulled those tasks out of the um, of the work of the um, of the workflow spreadsheet. Um, so you can quickly just see here, and I'll leave this up for a minute. Um, yeah, the key tasks assigned to the group around imagery workflow guidance, and in in some ways it covers absolutely everything that we've been talking about over the last few days, right from the beginning all the way through to the end. Um, so that's that's very useful and interesting. Now. As I say, why why I, why I haven't really engaged the working group and why John and myself um, kind of alongside Mike um, and then Nicola's come on board as well, which is super, um, super. Um, why we put ourselves forward to, to, to try and lead on this is that a, a, a few years ago, about a year, 18 months, two years before Big Picture One happened, um, various things were happening in CFAS um, across a whole range of programmes of work that kind of got us to a, I wouldn't say a crisis point, to a point where we really had to sit down and, and look across all the work that we we're doing with imagery. Um, and it led us to um, to coming up with a, a delivery action plan around imagery work throughout CFAS that looks incredibly similar to the big picture action plan, funnily enough. Um, so this, uh, this, this workflow, this action plan, whatever you want to call it, uh, takes us right through from imagery acquisition down through to preparation for and conducting your analysis. And we've got, as you can see, a bunch of work um, work packages and a bunch of tasks within those work packages that are very, very narrow focused to the specific needs and tasks that both that we have in CFAS and that we have alongside partners, which is where the likes of Mike Fraser come into this um, in the other um, admittedly very England centric um, DEFRA ALB groups. Um, for the statutory um, survey and monitoring work. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a natural synergy going on here, basically. Um, so what I really wanted to take the opportunity to do today, and um, the likes of Mike and Nicola are aware of this, so this isn't coming as a complete shock to them, but to the rest of the working group, they haven't seen it, and to the bulk of the, the whole big picture group, they haven't seen it. Um, it's just to introduce these work packages, flag up where we're already doing things, and where the absolute intention is to try and engage with everyone and do all of this in the most open way possible so that we can we can all benefit basically. So as you can, you know, as you can see, if I just quickly run through and introduce these, um, the links become pretty evident. And what what I think we can really win from today is as I'm going through this, you know, there's obvious overlaps, there's obvious, you know, bordering on duplication of effort or just duplication of effort. Um, and to come away from this these three days um, to be able to to you know tweak, alter, change our engagement with different groups, different folk um, that's going to benefit what we can what we can feed backwards into the big picture group as a whole, um, and what we all as individuals working on different programs and different projects can can get out of what we all need individually. I think will be fantastic. Um, so just very briefly, just to run through these. Um, so our work package one. Um, is it is exactly what it says on the tin um exactly what it says on the tin there in terms of what is the question what is the purpose of what are you doing what tool do you need to answer that question to do that job really really crucially oh, hang on if i just click on this we can see where the links are through to the work to the um to the specific tasks for um for the big picture group 
Uh, really, really importantly, what is your sample? Um, I know Jen's been talking about this a lot in different meet in different discussions over the last couple of days. Um, we've all touched on this. What is your sample? What does that mean about what you need to collect? That's really, really important. Um, and that comes up in a couple of the tasks that we've got under this working group um, to really to really nail that one. And and lastly, for lastly, for very much for our own purposes, and this this is again where you know some of um, some of what we need to cover for our own purposes, very sort of selfishly, goes far beyond um, what we need for the for the big picture working group. But the the two the two kind of feed off each other, um, and that's very specific. You know how to do it, how to operate um, those camera systems to actually deliver the data um, that we need. Um, I'll move on to number two. So uh, number two for us around um, image selection. Going back to the comments that Jen was making um, earlier in the week uh, about um, sample sizes, aggregation of images, and, and all of that stuff. Long before we get to that stage, we in the kind of in the statutory world, uh, we've got a fundamental problem that we are collecting way more imagery than we can ever afford to get processed by humans. So until AI can take over completely, uh, and as we were discussing yesterday, that that's not really ever actually the realist, the realistic view of where we're going. It's going to do some of these jobs to take the load off, but it's never going to be a complete replacement. So even when AI comes in and really we really see that pay off, we're still probably going to have more imagery than we can process manually and we can afford. So we've got to do something to to cut down that bill effectively. So this this brings us into um, filtering processes. Um, can, how quickly and how fast can we categorize imagery while we're collecting it? So this feeds exactly into task 21 under the working group. How can we categorize imagery as we're collecting it? This goes back to the conversation yesterday about should we just put bad imagery in the bin straight away? You know, that's I'm not I'm not going to say yes or no to that, but it's all of these questions that we've been talking about for the last few days feed into this this area um, of work. Um, and based on the objective. We need to understand the question for different questions. We need to keep different amounts of imagery. We need to analyze different numbers of images um, and what quality of images we can use will vary for different purposes. Again, so this harks straight back to where Hank started us off three days ago about what is the purpose of, of what we're doing. Um, once you've done that, um, we then need to actually filter out exactly which of those images we are going to use for analysis. And the really, really key one for me, which you know is my soapbox, um, is we need to get the best out of those images. We need to get the best out of the equipment that we can, you know, and I no way would I ever I get accused of saying that I want every single image we take to be, you know, publishable in a in a glossy magazine. And, and I, I wouldn't say that's the case at all, but um, there is so, so much we can do to, to get the best out of the equipment that we all use to get the best out of the images that we've all got, you know, as an analyst, what I always go back to if I'm spending my my two weeks, my 10 days, my four weeks, my six weeks, my eight weeks, staring at a bunch of horrible, slightly out of focus images where the white balance is all wrong and the lighting's terrible. I'm not a happy person. If I can provide me as an analyst or if I can provide, you know, everyone on this call as, a, as analysts with some in focus images with reasonable lighting and reasonable white balance so that the colors are as close as possible to, to, to on par, I, I'm going to have a happy day. You know, I might still get a bit mind numbed, but I'm going to have a happier day. Um, and that that sounds really simple, but um, and the key thing, the last bit of this with this work area is how can we streamline everything that I've just talked about? And I'll show you a bit of that in a second. Um, speed up, Ross, stop talking so much. Uh, work package three. Um, this is where we really, um, you know, I, I want to really stress this fact. This this looks like us saying we're just going off over here and we're doing all this on our own. Work package three for us is all the work that John is doing engaged through the big picture um, and everything that we discussed yesterday. Um, and I did a very bad impression of John around annotation, quantification groups, identification groups. So this really is where the synergies come in. Um, so this is really about working you know, through the big picture group to to feed off that and to feed into that. Um, and again, just within this particular work package, you can see some of the main links. Um, and the last bit here goes right back again to the beginning. What is your question? What are we doing with that imagery? This is where for us anyway, we come into how we aggregate our data across images, across segments of video, across across sites, across toes, etc. Um, 
how we approach the truncation, how we consistently approach that truncation, everything we've been talking about again for the last couple of days. And very lastly, uh, in terms of um, looking back at, um, oh, I did miss one bit. I'll go back to that. Uh, going back to um, going back to the very beginning again with um, some investigation of what we've come out with in terms of post aggregation and power and ability to answer our question. That has to go back right to the beginning of what was the question again? Have we achieved it? Have we done it? How do we need to do this in the future? What do we need to keep changing? The last thing I wanted to flag, I did plug it yesterday, but within a really key product um, for ourselves and that we've tried to put out there and feed into the wider group um, under work package three under taxonomic and morphotomic morph but taxonomic classification. We did touch on it yesterday, but putting out the um, the sort of hybrid Katami taxonomic label tree um, in Beagle that is actually in um, the paper that Robin was mentioning yesterday. It's published in that and a lot of people on this call have either had access to it, got access to it. That's you know that's a really key example of trying to just throw stuff out there into the community, into the group that we can all develop and work on collectively um, to really push that forward. So there's what we really want to highlight through this working group is is picking up those kind of key products that we can we can pump out there and then we can collectively work on improve rip apart build back together um so just one example um then of the sorts of things we're working on i guess the the one thing i can say or need to say is the snag here is this all sounds grand and wonderful none of this is coming with any specific budget so this is only things that we can do as part of ongoing business as usual work that we can try and just force in as many of these bits of development work as we can. So it will come in kind of fits and starts and little little sprints, which which does mean um, and this is why these sorts of opportunities to, to engage wider are so useful when working in that kind of fits and starts and sprints manner that the, the thing that does get missed is stopping looking around and maybe noticing and finding um, the links to make outside um, with the likes of folk on this call. Um, so, you know, I have no doubt at all that people will be able to look at this, go, hang on a minute, you've missed a trick. Someone else has already done this. We can feed this in. Um, but what I've got on the right here, and I've, I've stuck in development over it because there's a whole bunch of stuff that having just gone to see in January, we realized that we, when we thought it up, we need to do it in a different order. Um, anyway. So there's a, just an example of the kind of the workflow around the sort of image selection stuff down the left hand side. You've got a whole bunch of tools that are in development, either in development and being used and being shared to be tested wider or not quite in, de in enough development to share and be used wider yet. Um, and I'm not going to go into that in detail, but it's just, you know, just an example of the of what we're, we're trying to aim for, which is stuff that we want to pump out through the working group for the imagery workflow guidance. Um, to expand the scope wildly beyond just what we're doing in CFAS, what we're doing um, inshore with Natural England and the Environment Agency. And that's exactly where the likes of Nicola as a, a kind of a first point of contact. And then the working group as a whole can really come in, grab hold of this stuff and start saying, right, everything that we do branches off here and disappears off into a totally different area. And that might be because we're using different equipment, working in a different environment. Who knows? Uh, so as I say, this, this is, I think this is my last slide. Um, this, is, this is what comes next really, is we're getting very close, and this is kind of why I haven't put a meeting together. We're getting very close with a lot of these kind of small products as part of these tasks, where we can really start looking to pump these out through the working group. So my two arrows really is all of the different working groups that we've talked about over the last few days are already feeding into some of this work, and we need to really capture that and capitalize on it. And then we need to feed out through this imagery workflow guidance group um, the small the small seeds of, of work that we, we, we've been able to start um, and hopefully throw those out there for everyone else to to jump on and expand upon to then bring all the way back round into the um, into the specific tasks that we identified under this working group in the first place. So um, that is that is my last one. So as I say, that's it's a very quick run through and it's really just to flag up and make folk aware of some of the work that is already ongoing, even in a very limited fashion um, and to really welcome, encourage and open that door, please, to people to, to anything I've mentioned um, or through the working group. I will get one set up as soon. It might not be until mid late April, but it will be as soon as we 
have got five minutes to rub together um to really to please come along to that to to you know to point out you've missed something you, you you're doubling up you re you know the efforts here and I, I the other thing i haven't said is a huge amount of the credit for a lot of this actual work has to go to john hawes who can't be here this week um i'm very much running around in the background as a backseat driver heckling um but a huge amount of the work and the credit has to go to john and the work that he's doing in in many of the other groups within the big picture and on the big picture steering group whatever the group is hank i've forgotten what it's called um so we we are talking to folk, but I you know I fully put my hands up to welcoming the challenges of hang on you're duplicating you're you're missing something we're already doing this, and you know maybe we don't need to do something again. Um, I'll stop there. Um, Nicola, Mike, if you're on the call and you want to jump in at all, please do. What I would say is you know there's a lot of these elements of work that Mike uh, is specifically leading on the the kind of the inshore. Um, those those vari those, those variations upon a theme of the differences of what we can achieve, you know, sub 30 metres and shallower than 30 metres. Um, and then, yeah, engaging via Nicola is kind of our first route into opening this work up into everything else that goes beyond um, the kind of the little narrow focus bubble and the restrictions that we're under in the kind of statutory statutory work world. Thank you, Ross. Um, we've not had any questions as such yet but there's Excellent. a lot of discussion <laughs> a lot of discussion going on in the chat regarding um coming up with standards for what images we would just chuck and yes. never use and how everyone's kind of got different standards um in terms of like well, what think, image quality is acceptable for their purpose i, I, I think um, Kirsten, the, the main thing that i'd say and this all comes out of where, where did a lot of these conversations start is that I can only speak for, you know, again, the relatively small statutory world that I've spent most of the last, I'm not going to count how many years in, um, where just because we've done something for a long time is not necessarily a good reason to carry on doing it. And we shouldn't be, I'm very keen that we don't be afraid. And, and that might go for something as simple as we never delete video, we never delete imagery, etc. Thanks, Mark. Um, but the difference is now is that the amounts of data that we're collecting, how we're collecting that data and, and a better understanding of what we're trying to get out of it. And I, I don't think we should be afraid of, of being a bit bold personally, um, because otherwise we just tie ourselves in knots. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know if you can see the chat. There's a lot of back and forth I haven't, discussion. I haven't, I haven't um, gone through it. I, I couldn't see it while, while I had the screen up because only two screens is apparently not enough. <laughs> I'll read it afterwards. Yeah. But yeah, Nic Nicola, I don't know if you wanted to say anything from the few discussions we had or otherwise just anybody at all, please jump in and heckle. That was a really nice flowchart, Ross. Thank um, you. I was I just going to say we also, credit for it. we also have a whole bunch of tools for doing a bunch of those tasks um, at NOC. So mm. um, let's not duplicate our efforts. We could merge no. some of those things together. No, I mean, I, there's so many things over the last couple of days, Jen, that have kind of either flashed alarm bells or lovely shiny lights in my eyes um, where I think, hang on a minute, I'm missing something here. You know, there's someone we need to talk to. Similarly, Jamie, something you mentioned in terms of the Beagle training document. Again, John has spent a lot of time putting together, again, a very narrow, specific Beagle operating manual specifically for how we within the, the kind of statutory monitoring world are attempting to use Beagle at the moment. But in terms of it's, you know, that's a good starting point. What would be superb is to start bringing some of these different things together where we're all working roughly to the same thing, but with slightly different aims um, to be to start to be able to start bringing those together. will just, you know, it's the only way to do it, in my personal opinion. Otherwise, we're all not wasting time at all. But yeah, Getting out of those duplication of efforts, etc., would be great. So no, Jen, thank you. And yeah, to to pick up on some of those would be amazing because any anything we can learn um, at the moment, it's just desperately trying to work out what we can learn, what we can gather from from everyone else, and then work out how we can apply it in the in the restrictions of the kit, the the equipment, the systems, etc., that we've got available to us. Yeah, well, I think at the first big picture, we sat down and talked about who had what tools that could be used to put together for that. But obviously, like there's been a lot of work happening um, since well, I think then. 
And so, I think well, that's, um, that's the thing, like I said, part way through, the, the thing that I'm totally aware of is when everything I've just pre presented here has taken three, four years, because it just comes along in tiny little fits and starts when some work that we're already carrying out allows us to do a tiny little bit of development very quickly. And because it's not strategic necessarily, and because it's not got that, that kind of big long view with consistent time and, and resource allocated to it, it's very easy to miss those opportunities, I feel. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the same is true for ours. It's a bit uh, um, uh, fits and starts. We do a bunch of work on it and then we do a bunch of work on something else. But um, since we spent a lot of time doing um, quantitative work, um, we have our own kind of internal maybe less formalized workflow for them, those sort of things. But we have also done a bunch of studies to help us give some, you know, flesh out the evidence behind some of those decisions that might happen in the workflow. Oh, crikey, there is a lot in this chat about binning images. I've started something. Uh, it's maybe not about binning images. It's maybe about selecting the ones you'll move forward yes. with. No, I think that's exactly it. That's exactly the conversation I was having with a few colleagues uh, literally in January when we're at sea is it's it's exactly that. It's not binning them. It's just how do you very quickly and and strategically lump things into into and when I'm using bins in two different ways here into bins, not the bin, uh, lump them into bins, which means that you, you spend the appropriate amount of time working them up according to what their purpose is intended to be and whether they're going to be suitable for that purpose. Uh, Kerry and I think Hank and Jess, I have no idea what order you guys yeah, were in. Apologies, I can't see people's hands again. No worries. <laughs> right. but, yeah. I can see those three at the moment, so I don't mind who wants to whoever wants to go first, otherwise we'll go alphabetically. Uh, well, I, I, I'll, I'll just ask a quick, uh, qu a quick question. I mean, I've, I've got lots of comments about this. It's been <laughs> really interesting following this and I, it's great. It's great. I love, I love the way everyone's got an idea of a workflow. And here we're seeing really centralized workflows. There's so much I'd like to stop, but I don't want to take up the air time. I think the, the, re the thing I'm really picking up on and what, and what Ross has drawn to our attention is that, um, that funding is a blockage here and i wanted to sort of raise that for us all to get us to think about um maybe if i ask ross actually you know like to kick us off is what what type of funding do you think the working group here would need to move things forward is it like i've got a million pounds here go do it or is it like um um, you know, here's kind of here's like, you know, 10 grand here to work on this little bit. Here's here's five grand to work on that bit. There's 50 grand to do a study there to f figure out that. It, do you think it's more piecemeal or do you think it's something uh, uh, plan three? Do you think it's something that much like Jen's mentioned that we're just going to have to keep chipping away at it kind of on the back burner? OK. You could go about it in any of those three ways, Hank. OK. Um, you could say, uh, I'm going to be very glib and folk, uh, please disagree with me. Um, you could say, here's three million quid. Go and take a ship to sea for two weeks, experiment, do nothing but play and come up with all the answers. But uh, and, and but the problem is there, as I see it anyway, is that what's going to happen is that you're going to end up having to say, right, don't have the actual physical time to go and do that. So I need to go and get someone to go and do that for me. So you go and ask someone to go and do that for you. You give them a whole load of money and you come back and you've got a set of answers. But if that isn't closely enough tied into all of the actual questions that we're all trying to ask and the work that we're actually all trying to deliver, what you what I can what I can envisage you risking is that you go away and you come back with some wonderful solutions to problems, but you're not able to implement them. They're not re they're not actually tied closely enough to the operational need that you can't implement them. So I'd go more to your latter two options. Obviously, the third option is the least preferable. The mm -hmm. middle option of piecemeal bits is where you can really have some wins because 
the bulk of what I've, what I've talked about already, the biggest problem that we have personally, and this goes back to exactly what Jen was identifying in terms of missing those opportunities to link up with other folk, missing the opportunities to just stick your head up, look around and go, there's something that's happening, latch onto it, talk to someone, learn from them and build and build that together um, is time. It's just the li those little pockets of resource that you describe in your option two potentially give you the ability to just basically just earmark people's time to give them enough time to focus on it and it to be slightly less of a panicked rushed fits and starts development because mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that you know we've got all the answers or all the resource or all the expertise at all um, but having that time for folk who know exactly what their the purpose is and the objective is to look up and engage with the folk that have got the expertise have got the, the systems in place and to learn and engage could be on to a winner and your last bit in terms of the do we just carry on working piecemeal well we'll get somewhere eventually doing that it just will be slow that's my that's just a, a personal off the cuff yeah. answer uh kerry you put your hand down do you not want to talk to me kerry's computer's crashed so i think ah. she's probably she just sent me a text so i think she's probably trying to sort it okay. out so she might come back in in a no minute worries. Grant, if she comes back, I think Jess, your hand up was before Jen, so I'll go. Yeah, it's only a quick thing just to say that we also have a a guide for Biggle usage that we we've built that I wrote a while ago. That's probably out of okay. date, but we are process trying to update it with the updates that Biggle's got or going through at the moment um, for that. So I think there's a real, I guess, element here. Where we've got lots of different people working on guides and various different things to help them with different yeah and i think software it's... and we can just we should just have that as a sharing either use teams or use the you know from the big picture side just people be able to share their their documents and things that they have yeah, so that, that others can that be helped sounds, with it that sounds really good because something i noticed in the chat earlier on feeding off the conversation that mark and dan and graham and i sort of chipped into a little bit we're having i completely agree with somebody's comment that a lot of the biggest hurdles is the getting set up in the first place and that is not necessary you know it's institution institution specific problems and issues and it issues and logistics I, you know that's always going to be specific but a lot of the general how do you actually get up and running stuff should be able to be very general and you know one size not one size fits all but you know what i mean very shareable um admittedly yeah when you get into the nuts and bolts the real detail of specific objectives requiring specific um approaches that might be more where it branches out a little bit but no i completely agree jess completely and agree. also and it also cries out for i hate to say it but standards or yep. some kind of guidance that is in place for people that are doing annotations and yep. software like that that people are probably already implementing inside their own organizations and we just need to share what we're doing so pe other people know and, and before, don't and before spend hank, the same amount of time wasted trying to figure it out and before hank needs to come off mute there's a working group for that um Jen and then Chris and then maybe Kerry. I think one of the tricky things about funding for this particular group is that um, let's be honest, it's not sexy. No, it's business um, as usual. That's right. Exactly and so um, uh, whilst, you know, talking about things like um, building capacity at Medin to um, deal with large amounts of data, um, you know, big data is uh, quite a hot topic right now. So that's something that I can see as having a good story. Um, and um, uh, people are always interested in the taxonomic aspect that certainly has a, a public science draw, right? I mean, if you think about the newspaper, reading about new species is like splash. Um, whereas uh, how do we go about making sure we count things in the right kind of way that's like really not um, not cool. So um, the way that we have um, worked on this and the reason why it happened somewhat piecemeal is that we tend to add this on to lots of other projects. So we've got like some scientific project that's going out and we're like, oh, we could um, do a little bit extra while we're doing that in order to accomplish one of these things that we want to know about our process and our method. Um, it's not a holistic way of doing things for this group. And I, I really think the benefit in this group is um, from bringing everybody's expertise together, um, not necessarily from um, just drawing on, you know, uh, particular experiences. Um, so in that sense, 
I, from the, the collaboration aspect, I don't think that you could be like, here's a million pounds. Also, I don't think anybody would give you a million pounds to work on this. It's too boring. Um, but um, so I think we end up having to go down the more piecemeal route to do sections of it. In many ways, like that's more manageable because pretty much all the people that are working on this group are also working in some of the other working groups. So like it's not going to be possible. I also don't, I would disagree with Ross. I don't think you could, even if you had a million pounds, um, design a study, go to see and get like all the answers you wanted for this because a lot of this we learn by doing um, and failing. Um, just like we talked yesterday about, yesterday about having to try and break the AIs. Yeah, sometimes we got to realize that we did a study where the stats were rubbish <laughs> and, then, and go back and realize that, you know, we should make a mistake. Um, somebody yesterday mentioned something which I thought was very astute. I'm sorry, I don't remember who you were, but it was really, really thoughtful. And that was the doing a small portion of your study before you do a big portion of your study. I mean, you learn so much from doing that. And I hope that by putting everything together from this group, we can take all the stuff we've learned from doing all those different things and prevent the need for everybody to have to do 10% of their study before they do 100% of their study every time. Um, but I think it, in terms of funding, it probably is going to have to be piecemeal. On that front, I would say uh, the organization I work for struggles really, really hard with small pots of money. So you mentioned five or 10 grand. I don't think Knock gets out of bed for that. Um, <laughs> But uh, that's an administration administrative issue for us um, and uh, something that I will go back to them about. But I think the smaller um, work packages, especially where it can be attached to something else. I saw somebody in the chat write, we should put the boring work packages together in order to get money. I agree with you, but I would also say let's team up with the sexy work packages to get money too. So. Um, I think a lot of what happens in this work package is um, easy to tie into what other work packages are working on and maybe get some funding from whatever they do in order to enhance what's happening here. I completely agree, Jen. That sound, that's yeah, completely identify with that. And I think something you were saying right at the beginning of, of that um, about bringing together the expertise that we've got amongst the group, that, that's exactly why, um, why I think, you know, a bit like Mark was saying yesterday, why eventually when when Hank was looking for volunteers my hand might have stayed higher than everybody else's for this group was simply because I, I, I knew the stuff I was chatting about there I know what we're already trying to do and what where I see the big win is that once I can start pumping this stuff out to throw it up there is a bit of a straw man and we can all jump on it collectively that's where I think we can stand to to make the, the most gains that makes sense yeah uh, we've just got one more question from Chris and yeah. then we can move on to Hank's presentation and then come back at the end for any more discussion. No uh, no, uh, thanks, Chris. I mean, it was very, I mean, Jen took the words out of my mouth there completely, you know, uh, but uh, as well as that, it's thinking perhaps about the funding models, you know, like, I mean, absolutely, we're not going to be able to go to NERC with something like that for like capacity, but there are funders that whose business is dealing with building capacity across networks like the scale that we're talking about and things like Horizon or um, or Interreg, even the Interreg Arct Arctic Periphery calls, you know, there, there are funders that you could potentially kind of target for something like this. And the problem is that we become victims of our own success because, you know, we're already doing this anyway for free. So <laughs> in a way, it's effectively like, why would anybody kind of throw money at it? So yeah, it's no, absolutely, Jen, and you're right. It's, so it becomes a marketing, a marketing thing, uh, a branding exercise, which is always uncomfortable for all of us. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad it was. Uh, yeah, yeah. It wasn't me that said it was sexy. I think that, that was a difficult thing for a, for a four year old uh, man to say. No, no, thanks, but <laughs> so thanks, Jen. All right. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Ross, for presenting. Uh, if we can just move over to Hank now for our discussion on technology and imagery acquisition. Great. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, uh, that um, should be on your screen in a moment. Uh, just a few slides to run through again to frame this one. Um, this. Uh, 
is the oddball of the session, but it does link. It does link in some ways in that um, we will be looking to provide guidance ultimately from these acquisition um, guidance with regards to what what ways you would you would you would acquire your imagery. So um, what are we talking about? Um, Oh, hang on a minute. Uh, apologies. There we go. Okay. Um, so first of all, um, uh, there were a lot of conversations at the Big Picture workshop um, two years ago about acquiring uh, imagery. And um, when when we were sending out invitations, we 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 made sure that we had a broad spread of of people who had worked in the field in a variety of different ways. And in a lot of ways, this is this is this is where we all get in. Uh, well, a lot of us got into what we do through field work. You know, some of us started out as divers and are still divers, and some of us then shifted to working on slightly bigger boats using sort of drop cameras. And then some of us work for other organizations that went further out to sea um, that um, that had um, you know you know, access to even bigger cameras and ROVs and, you know, even AUVs now. So there are a huge number of uh, sampling platforms available for use. And a lot of it's, a lot of it is the stuff that gets you outside, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the thing that a lot of us have actually been missing recently. Um, and um, there's a massive uh, range. Uh, there, there are a large range of issues. <laughs> Because there are so many different systems and acquisition formats um, break it down roughly into stills and um, video cameras, but you also have like laser scanners now, and you have sort of things, clever things that you can do with your cameras and stereoscopic cameras. You can sort of get sort of depth, depth, depth perception and things like that. And and then the recording formats can all be very different. Lots of things go wrong in there. And when it comes to thinking about sort of attempting, even considering standardizing these approaches across the piece to come up with a standard product um, that uh, everyone can access using standard methods and getting standard data, it's a minefield. So one of the things that was conveyed through the workshop was that it was it was maybe too difficult a thing to try and standardize across platforms, gear types, depths, habitats, um, and that perhaps we should better focus our efforts in standardizing the outputs that come from the surveys. So that really comes down to the data, trying to bend and manipulate the data so that it, it conforms to standards rather than trying to sort of all agree that we we all stock the same type of dive camera in the same housing and the same sort of drop down systems and the same AUVs and so on. Now, if 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 we could standardize whatever comes from the acquisition across the different purposes that we've identified and we have begun to identify um, purposes, we've we've honed in on three purposes, as we heard earlier on in the workshop. And I'm sure as time goes on, we're going to flesh out a few more. But if we could come up with products that, and by products, I mean the end point of that acquisition, um, where you're you're kind of generating raw data that is about to be crunched and processed. Perhaps it's maybe more the processed is what we're thinking about. Um, get that so that it 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 meets. It meets um, our our differences in our operational budgets, and um, when when we mention organisation specific gear here, you know you're not going to change your 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 two hundred and fifty thousand pound camera system that you've been trying to get uh, for many many years and you've just bought. You're not going to change that just because a new camera has come out and you're like, oh, you know, I should put that new camera on, but you know, I've already paid this. So we need to work with what we have, and go with what our organizations like using. But there was a sense that came out of the workshop last time that we should try and focus on 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 the product um, that comes out of it rather than on the tools themselves. Keep the tools to the things that we like. 
Now, we put them together. We put together all the thoughts um, uh, uh, into the action plan. And the bottom right corner then is the acquisition of imagery section, which I've blown up here. To share something with you, this was one of the harder sections of this action plan to pin down. And I still feel that we've not entirely pinned it down. We were able to divide things into rough groups of categories. But as you'll be able to tell roughly, um, there aren't many levels to this. There's a whole bunch of stuff that needs to happen at the start um, that feeds down um, to one place. And the whole plan focuses, this, this whole part of the plan focuses on periodically updating existing guidance um, on acquisition and analysis of imagery, which, which can apply to everything, to reflect new developments and to produce new guidelines where necessary. This is a catch-all task. The basis says, update your guidance periodically. Make sure that everything's up to date and so that it, it's applicable, that includes all the new technologies. This is the main focus of this entire group of tasks. The main bulk of the tasks are a set of reviews of different aspects of acquisition equipment. And these were perhaps the key, the key thoughts, the key tasks that we were able to pin down from the group um, last time. Um, and um, in addition to, I'll, 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 I'll touch on these in a little minute. Um, uh, the other tasks that came out of this cluster, um, thankfully have been swallowed up by um, uh, the project working group that Ross was just talking about. You know, so th those, those are gonna go into a different group. So we're left, we're left really with sort of one big group of tasks and they're all types of reviews. So out of all of the, the, the project working groups that we've been able to agree on so far, um, this is one that we haven't, we haven't, we haven't got to the point of, of having a project working group yet. We haven't, um, we haven't even tried to be honest. We've been too busy with all of the others and all of the others, the, they, they seemed a lot more pressing and a lot more immediate because I suppose currently we are acquiring imagery day by day. We do have our systems that we use day by day. However, we are aware that the technology is changing and that there are many um, really exciting things happening all the time. And uh, we're not always keeping abreast of those changes because there's simply too much going on. Uh, we're not always necessarily using the best available tools at the time. And I think that is what the essence of this, um, if we could form a project working group here, if there are people interested in carrying out these reviews or working um, uh, uh, in some way to carry out the reviews, then I would say that the focus of that group is to find, is to, is to, is to, is, is, is to review a whole bunch of different approaches and to recommend which approaches are the best ones um, for your purposes. So you might be using a really old camera system that's great, and that's just your favorite camera system and you've been using it you know, forever. And you're not aware that for the same cost, you can get a far superior system that would maybe work better in some, you know, you know, in some shape or form and simply a little piece of information like that could just change your world. You know, it can make things so much easier. I'm not saying um, that that's the case in every in instance, but but I think this should be the essence of this group, of this project working group. So so I I, I, I put together this um, this rough overview of these tasks, these stray tasks that we haven't been we haven't been able to pin down yet. Um, and this is some sort of appeal as well to everyone on the call and the wider group um, to consider these tasks and to think about how we could build those in perhaps to our work flows. Um, so let me let me talk a little bit more about the tasks um, specifically here. OK, so um, the first group of reviews there are three blocks. The first group are, are focused on equipment. And the three key things that came out of 
the last big picture workshop, which are all, they're all recommendations that people put down. We, we didn't ignore any information. So everything went in. Um, the one, which is one of my pet favorites, I chat frequently with Graham and a few others about this. Um, it's about sort of different video, different video f formats, the difference between using an SD camera, an HD camera, upping your ante to 4K and then to 8K. I had a chat with a BBC um, cameraman uh, about a year ago who, who was using a 16, 16K camera system and just sort of spoke of it as though everyone uses a 16K camera system. Um, I was like, yeah, we probably won't be using one of them, you know. But, um, you know, the, 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 this is a fascinating um, task. And, you know, I think we would all like to use the most, um, the, you know, cameras with the highest resolutions. Um, a higher resolution could, could give you the ability to, you know, provided your frame rate is, is quite high, you could, you could grab um, sort of frame grab stills from your image. And those, would, those could be of equivalent resolution provided, you know, it's not moving around um, to, to a high resolution still image that we collect. So, um, uh, you know, you wouldn't need then to collect still images and video. You could just collect the video. You know, there's one bit of processing done there. You could then mosaic the video too. And you could collect as many sort of frame grabs as you want. You know, that, that's really cool. And that's something we could all step up to. But the bigger the, the, bigger the, re the, the higher the resolution, the bigger the files. And then storage becomes even more of an issue. So anyway, that's, that's my pet favorite, as you can probably tell. Um, another one uh, there is about the low cost camera systems. Now, what we're talking here, um, this is about the time GoPros were just like taking off. You know, they, they were, uh, you know, in fact, they had, they had, they had taken off. And now there are other low cost camera systems on the market. Excellent things to strap on to your main camera gear as a backup. Often you can sometimes watch your main camera gear doing its thing just, just to have a record of that. Um, equally so, some of them are so good now, they, they can be your main camera system. You know, if you're doing um, shallow water work as a diver, you know, I've seen many divers just use a GoPro instead of a massive kind of camera rig. So, um, but a review of those systems and, you know, you know, you know coming up with some sort of comprehensive uh, document that, 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 that highlights the pitfalls, the pros and the cons, would be some, was something that, that, that people really wanted last time. Um, laser profiling equipment has uh, increased quite a lot. Um, uh, some people might have seen it being applied to hydrothermal vents. You get sort of a 3D model of a hydrothermal vent made with lasers. It's just incredible, incredible technology. Um, so equipment reviews are one of the areas um, that that uh, that were um, that were identified as. Um, as needed uh, in the last workshop. And that's why they're on the tasks here. Um, the next one really are the data processing reviews. So this is once, once, once you've got your imagery, now obviously the type of camera you use is, is very important, but um, it's really the, the two branches here are uses of photogrammetry, which I know, I know, you know, I've heard that mentioned over the last couple of days, and I know a few people do use that. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know too much about it, but I do know it's more in the research world. Um, it hasn't made it into sort of mainstream monitoring yet. Um, but why not? You know, you know, um, uh, a review of this and its its pros and cons could be incredibly useful, and it might actually work for certain instances. So these um, are are a case study recommendations. These two tasks. The, the other task, like I should say, is Mosaicing. Um, many, many years ago, um, I, I, I did a little bit of mosaicing myself. It wasn't particularly shiny, um, but it did the job. Um, uh, by contrast, I remember reading about mosaics that were 400 square meters over, um, over a reef uh, uh, area in the tropics. And you could zoom in on pretty much any area and collect virtual quadrants, as many as you wanted over the reef. Like, a fantastic that was that was um uh, 14 years ago now so you know i'm sure it's come on a little bit since then you know should 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 we be using mosaics more often um where possible um and the final 
the final group of um, of the reviews. Just moving us on now. Um, uh, these ones are, are 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 more focused. They're called the data acquisition reviews. Um, there is um, a need for reviewing citizen science approaches. I think we'll all agree how valuable it would to understand how how everyday um, uh, opportunities in our in our in our in our personal lives uh, when we're out and about doing stuff. Numerous organisations like Sea Search um, go out there for fun, and the opportunities of feeding some of their data in to to databases after some sort of checking process. Uh, I've heard um, iNaturalist has come up several times um, uh, in the workshop. You know, can how can we make good use of this to put more eyes, more eyes out there, basically collecting more evidence from places where we don't go? Um, Diver-based methods have needed a review for a long time as they continue to change and evolve, and some of them haven't changed at all. And so those those would just be continued, right? But in other approaches, um, there was a strong call in the last workshop to sort of have another look at these and come up with more standardized approaches across habitats, for example. And the last two of, of these tasks are really about um, what we call ancillary equipment and the supporting data that are collected alongside the camera systems. So, you know, what sort of things do you strap onto your camera system? Um, these are less focused on imagery, I suppose. Um, there were more sort of, uh, there were there were comments people made, we decided to act on them and put them in there. And these are about sort of thinking about what things you put on your camera system that can add extra value, extra context to the image. And, um, um, you know, the, that supporting information can be another person's primary data, for example, uh, but it can also greatly enrich the value of your image itself. So those are the reviews. Um, and uh, I thought I'd just then move us on to just discuss a few of the of of the issues um, uh, just to round us up on some things. And then I've got a very quick kind of a quick kind of future scenario just to sort of stir the pot a little bit, you know, some more food for thought. So the acquisition is issues, we do have different gear types. We've got the different media formats. Now, as what seemed to be the case a few years ago, there's less focus on trying to standardize that. Um, with different camera formats, yes, I've already touched on that. The, the difference uh, re resolutions comes at a penalty for storage and um, I guess speed of transfer between things, uh, but but you can get a lot more out of your image. Also, uh, ask ourselves a question, do we need 16K imagery to tell whether there's a cup coral on the seabed? You know, you know, sometimes sometimes it's good enough uh, the way it is. We don't actually need, you know, the bigger tool. So so perhaps there won't be a need to actually, um, you know, go beyond go beyond a certain type of resolution. Or maybe we'll modify our systems to only sample certain resolutions for certain purposes. Um, um, we've touched already on the standardized outputs um, and the mosaics. So I'll I'll I'll. I'll now finish us up on um, a future sort of acquisition pipeline. You know, is this what the future will look like? And by the future, let's say, you know, 10 years time from now. So um, you've got your semi-autonomous fleet that, that goes around a bunch of um, basically AUVs that you can launch from the shore and they sort of go off and they cruise around and do stuff. You've got your big, deep water AUVs, you know, that you launch out to sea and they do their thing too. So they acquire your benthic imagery data. Um, uh, they, they have a variable resolution capability where this is a, you know, a, you know, a clever semi-autonomous fleet that, that has um, sensors uh, that can, that can uh, track what, what type of seabed it's going over. And where it where it where it appears to be complex, um, it will switch sort of to a different camera system that is higher resolution and a higher frame capture rate. And then when it goes over the areas where you don't really have that, 
um, then it switches to, to just a lower resolution uh, format, you know, so it saves space. Um, uh, then um, when it pops up to recharge its batteries or however these things are powered, um, then it uh, sends a data transmission. And I have been told that that this that this does work actually already to some extent um uh and yeah that will basically ping it up to the satellite and then that will come down and land into your laptop which is incredible um uh next up um that will uh, be fed through cabling and databases into the network of imagery databases um or a centralized system if that's where we all end up um and from there, it can be accessed by uh, artificial intelligence algorithms, which will which will take that imagery, they'll scrub it up, they'll maybe bend the bad stuff if that's what we want, and they'll keep all the good stuff, and they'll come up with sort of standardized um, uh, standardized sort of cleaning and maybe basic annotations, which will then need to be um, well, which which will then feed back into the database, so. So you then, you know, you then enrich your database and your learning uh, processes um, th through that. Um, we then uh, obviously have to check things, you know, like people are going to be working at every step of this, f fixing all the machines, making sure it all works. Um, but are you, you know, is this where you begin to get sort of quality control checking? by people to make sure the AIs are doing what they're supposed to be doing, or even, you know, interfacing with those, um, interfacing with that network and saying, I specifically want information on these taxa from this data set, which I know is being acquired by the fleet of AUVs currently out there, um, and click go and come back at the end of the weekend and there it's done. Um, then, you know, that analysis will be carried out by by a person, I would imagine. Um, maybe that will be sort of partly partly automated too. But you know that that will then go to the analysis, the interpretation, to the report, for whatever it's supposed to do, um, and uh, redesigning, redesigning, sending new um, instructions out to the fleet, and um, and round we go again. Um, is this is this is this where we're heading? Um, you know, probably not entirely, but I imagine there will be maybe bits bits of the future that will look something like that in ten years' time. Maybe bits already look like that, and I just don't know about it. Um, okay, so rounding up now, um, our our sort of key key points are that um, the big picture workshop did suggest that the standardization of the data outputs was the key thing to aim for in this project working group, not the gears. That there were two sets of tasks. Um, the quality control tasks are being tackled by the guidance group, um, but the reviews, the reviews need a home. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's no project working group f f for that at the minute. Could they form nice kind of masters? project reviews they're nice literature reviews for student projects are they are they sort of discrete pieces of work that we could bolt on to other pieces of work um uh finally um i think uh it goes without saying that 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 do we need for a more strategic approach for our acquisition um uh longer term you know the first level of the of the action plan here was just to do all the reviews produce guidance documents, but then what, you know, is the next level then sort of getting in touch with with the engineers and all the developers and trying to um, uh, influence the development of the future systems so that they better meet our needs? I mean, that that happens already, but is that is that where things are going to go going forward? Um, there, that's me. So uh, I'll hand back to Kirsten. Lovely, thank you, Hank. Um, we've had a bit of discussion in the chat around uh, the potential for the various UK slash English government agencies, which are all using the same um, the same technology to maybe band, like what the potential is for them to band together um, and produce sort of standards for training and uh, equipment setup and things. So a bit of discussion. Yeah. Um, for anyone who is interested or involves going on the chat, uh, a flag from Chris McGonigal saying that 
uh, Ulster University, along with a couple of others, are uh, reviewing non-invasive methods for monitoring subtitle components of Natura 2000 sites, um, which could be linked in to this as they're, mm. they'll be producing a report. Um, Excellent. We've got Chris McGonagall still got his hand up. I'm not sure if that's. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <It's been laughs> sorry, that's from the last time. Apologies. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add. Um, oh, I can okay. see a few start, hands up. I was, was going to oh. say, I did, yeah. I did stick my hand up part way through, but I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in. I can come in at any point. Yeah, I think you're good to go. Okay. Um, um, Hank, what I was going to say in terms of um, the areas of the, the tasks in that, that bit of the action plan that don't really have a home in a working group, some of them, I'm going to regret saying this, some of them I think, oh, oh hang on, no, 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 oh, the, the, the last slide you're on was, per was quite helpful actually. Oh, okay. Um, uh, here. No, yeah. that next one, that one, that one. So yeah, where we're looking at things like the reviews of equipment, et cetera, which doesn't have a, a real home and standardize or oh, not the standardization of data outputs, but mainly mainly that big long list of reviews. Now we're not we're not gonna be able to hit on all of them, but what I can imagine is what we can put out through the workflow guidance working group might it I, I don't see it as I'm not putting forward that we're going to suddenly produce yeah, yeah. all these reviews but what I can imagine is feasible and much easier is that through the engagement through that working group what we can at least identify and either through teams or through some other system whether it's google whatever some shared access thing what I think is totally achievable is um, congregating bringing together at least people just piling in their reference material. I mean, I, I'm just thinking of the, the paper from Robin that we were talking about yesterday or the day before, those sorts of key examples that, you know, hypothetically in an yes. ideal world, you would draw all together into a, a lovely review paper, document, report, et cetera. But for an achievable middle ground, what should be achievable through something like the, the imagery workflow group for some of those reviews is to at least be identifying and pulling together, you know, shared resources, identifications, even if it's a, a Mendeley library, whatever it is. Um, certainly, we've got a big imagery Mendeley library started across um, CFAS, and I think we've shared it with a few people outside. But you know, yeah. that's the sort of thing that we can we can build on to try and get some of those tasks done. Um, my second point was going to be, and I think Graham has actually taken the words right out of my mouth with the image that he just put up. Because what I was going to say, Hank, in terms of a lot of your comments about the video and, you know, 4K, SD, HD, 8K, 16K, all yeah, of that. Yeah. And, you know, we've, we've had this discussion many, many months ago on the on the chat in Teams on the big picture group, especially when we talk about video and stills as well. All of that goes completely out the window, depending on things like codecs, compression rates. You know, all of that stuff, you know, basically it can mean that 8K video can still be completely rubbish if you apply a horrendous compression and codec algorithm, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So there is there's a few more steps to it, you know, just counting, mm. just looking at, met, at pixel by pixel dimensions, you know, compare a smartphone to a full frame SLR. Comparing pixel to pixel dimensions isn't the whole story. And mm. I think that's an important thing to say, and I'm not going to go on about it anymore because I just get onto a soapbox and annoy everyone. Yeah, 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 but, yeah. Um, okay. We, we, it's very easy to fall down a rabbit hole of kind of focusing on pixels and and missing. And I think Graham's hit the nail on the head with his with the diagram he's just put up. What what the reality is there? And again, it's just something that needs to be carefully considered. And it comes back to exactly what Mags was saying about just using the same equipment and the same spec is is a thing, but there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks, Ross. Hey, we've got a few more hands up. Apologies, I'm not sure who's came first because they're coming coming through in batches for me. Um, we've got Jen Durden. I think they might be missing a task for this this uh, section. Um, not to join Ross on his um, anti-pixel number soapbox here, <laughs> but um, I, I mean, I hope it's big it's, enough for both of like, us. Like it's quite warm, so go on. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, uh, first of all, I think this section merits its own project working group. 
Um, I think there's quite a lot of stuff in this this uh, section, and I think one of the things we kind of maybe missed when we were making this uh, in the plan development group um, moving around was um, the wins we can get from things that aren't necessarily buying the new gadget. I think we get really seduced into, you know, megapixels and, you know, whatever the latest cool stuff is, and everybody's got like a garage or a set of shelves with all the cameras they don't use anymore. But um, there's a lot of wins that you can make on collecting high quality data um, just from doing things like making sure your lights are pointing in the right direction, um, making sure you've double checked that your spacing lasers actually are parallel and not, you know, slightly out. So um, there's a lot of like procedural stuff there that I think can help us with our existing tech to get higher quality um, image information. So one thing that's not in there is, um, you know, like uh, making sure that, uh, I guess I focus a lot on lighting because I do a lot of deep water work. But, you know, if you've got vignetting yeah. in your photos because your lights are, you know, splayed out, or maybe you're working in an area where there's some natural light and you're trying to compensate for that with additional lighting and you're not doing, you haven't quite got that tweaked, then, um, it, you know, you, you could quite easily get better pictures with not a huge amount of effort. Yeah. I, I guess I'm conscious that there's lots of people in this group that haven't got a lot of cash to outlay on new kit. Now they may want advice when they're gonna buy a new kit of what they should think about what that is, but like um, we, we don't necessarily always have to have it be like the buyer's guide to the next cool stuff. It could also be like, how can we fix what we already do, tweak it to make it better without a lot of cost. Yeah. Um, and I guess to that end, my other point would be um, not every synthesis and recommendation has to say like the minimum standard for something is X. Your recommendation could be a decision tree to help people um, make good choices on how they do things rather than um, making it a prescriptive standard. You know, standardization doesn't necessarily have to mean you must do things, you must buy this, you must only do this. It can always, it can, standardization can be how can we standardize the way that we make decisions so that they work out the best for us. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Um, we've got Samantha Hornbury with her hand up as well. Um, it was more a comment, really, just having looked through the chat. Um, the comment Magnus uh, made about uh, collaborating uh, with government agencies. So we, um, within the IFCAs, we share lots of equipment um, and kind of do training together on, on some of that equipment as well. Uh, but also, we collaborated with CFAS. Uh, in the past uh, and more recently, um, it was only last week, I think, I had a chat with Ross about some ROVs and so that that's really, really useful and um, the more that we can do, the better. Um, yeah, that was just a comment really, just going back through the chat and um, just Yes, it's good. Like, it's good that you, uh, we see we see that that exact type of collaboration um, inshore with CFAS. We see it with CFAS and JNCC, JNCC and Marine Scotland Science offshore. Uh, now, Natural Resources Wales, I think, as well, um, uh, uh, and JNCC offshore. And then I'm sure there are research collaborations out there as well. So it, it, it yeah, it, you know, it's great. You know, it's great that these are happening. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Joey, you've got a hand up as well. Hello, yep. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kirsten. I have, um, I guess, one specific and one, one, one general point. A more specific one is around the um, the environmental um, data, the oceanographic data um, review that we touched on. And I think that that is quite an important thing to to consider because in the last couple of years we have um, tried on our, on our surveys to, to kind of get the quick wins to strap the available oceanographic equipment onto the side of your drop frame or, or your sledge and you know see what it can tell us about um, you know th those different parameters temperature salinity and that but we've not really it you know it's been low cost but we've not really managed to you know find out a lot from it because we can't really link that point data from uncalibrated um, equipment to 
um, the kind of the, the wider models. There's a, an issue of scale there, which, which is, yeah, is a is is an issue when you want to put your imagery data into the into the wider context of you know um, what 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 the drivers of the um, the ecology are. Um, so that's one thing. So it, yeah, it'd be nice if we could do something on that. And then the I guess the wider the, the other more general point was around the the reviews and. You know, if there isn't much um, um, opportunity to put these detailed reviews together over over the next while, maybe a quick win could just be people saying what's gone wrong with them. So you know, I use this this approach or this system, and um, uh, it was awful. But then I did this, and and now it's working fine. You know, a, a collection of that sort of information might be useful for the for you know the wider community. Almost like user stories. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, but but and, bad, and bad well, user stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. We've got a couple of things coming through in the chat. Uh, a question from Barbara uh, Nev Nevis Neves. I'm not sure. Sorry. <laughs> um, should changes in camera resolution over time be an important consideration for monitoring? Um, that's a Big question. I'm sure we've all got the thoughts on. Um, uh, Jen is uh, very, very positive on this. Basically, saying yes. Um, I, I, I think it. I think it is. Um, I mean, it, it's what it's what you can get from that image, if that is determined by your camera and your resolution. Then you're going to have different types of data that come from two time points. So it is going to make a big difference. Um, you're better to have as, as a consistent a system as possible. Um, would anyone else, else like to contribute to that point? I don't think the resolution matters so much as long as you compensate for it with your study design. So if you say, um, I'm only going to look at changes that I can detect equally in all of my time points, because that's really what you're looking for, real change is is related to detection. So you don't want to have that bias in there. So maybe you say, um, in my original camera, I could only see things that were five centimeters or bigger. So then you will only look at change in those things, regardless mm -hmm. of whether you can measure things that are one centimeter or one millimeter or whatever. So um, y y of course, you need to take that into account. But more importantly, you need to think about um, what things you can um, compensate to make it a real fair comparison. Um, I would argue that camera resolution is maybe um, less difficult there than it is uh, other changes that generally come with camera resolution. We focus a lot on resolution, but we don't focus on the fact that you put this one in on an ROV, whereas this one you dragged across the seafloor on the end of a rope, or um, you had lights on this one, but you didn't have lights on this one. You only took these samples during the autumn and you took these ones during the spring. You did this at night versus you did this during the day. I think. Um, we focus a lot on megapixels, and that's maybe a bit unfounded. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think Jamie was next, the next hand I saw. Apologies if anyone else was first. My Teams is a bit all over the place. <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to add to the point that Jen was saying um, a few comments back about the, you know, you don't have to have fancy equipment to get good imagery to be honest the best imagery still imagery i work with is from a drop frame camera it's far superior because the lighting as jen said and the flash unit and everything and neil can contest to this because he's been on survey with us that you know we spend time we drop the camera over in shallow water you know we do photography settings we practice we change the settings we play around with it until we get the quality we want and then we go out to deep water so i think you know, you can do quite a lot with little, but it's how you use it, isn't it? Yeah, uh, thank you. We've got uh, Stephen Dewey hand up as well. Yeah, hi. Um, really, I'm just now going to be uh, um, back in what a few other people have said. Um, Firstly, I think there should be a working group for this. Um, I think it's a very important area and it needs a working group. It shouldn't just be uh, pushed to one side. Um, the better we can make um, the acquisition side, um, the better everything else will be. Um, in terms of in terms of the 
the way forward a lot of this will fall into the workflow working party because a lot of it can be part of that workflow in terms of the decisions you make how you start your planning um i think we've encountered over many years um a few years ago working with agencies is that they weren't really asking what question <clears throat> they wanted to know the answer to or they didn't know the question what the answer to so they didn't really know what their data was for they didn't really know you know have a deep understanding of, of 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 their aims and objectives so i think to get good imagery you first of all need to know what you want to achieve you need to know what you want to be looking at um you then need to know the environment you're going to be working in so you need to have an understanding of what the stability is going to be like or if you know what the water depths are going to be like what the currents are going to be like you need to understand what your vessel is going to be like um and then um, you need to work out what platform to put your camera on because actually platform is really, really, really important. And the, the way the platforms change depend changes how you can use that camera. So, you know, high resolution cameras um, are all well and good, but they're definitely not the answer. We quite often use a very old Konsberg 14208, which is a five megapixel camera for stills. And the image quality is amazing because it's, if it's deployed correctly with good lighting, um, a good flash gun and a good frame that's nice and stable and the vessel, uh, how the vessel operates. Um, you know, if all those things come together, then the imagery can be really good and it's a very cheap, um, readily available um, system that delivers really good results. Um, the other thing is to then field review to make sure that like the last person said, you know, try it out. You don't just go and do the survey, you know, set your camera up, put it on the frame, get it on the vessel, put it in the water, take some photos, take some video and then review it, find out what the image looks like, tweak your lights. So like exactly you don't get um, some variation in your light distribution. Um, check your flash gun, work out if all your settings are correct, make sure your, your white balances are good and then you can go and you know do your survey and review in the field. When you've taken, you know, when you've done a video deployment, review it, work out if it can be improved. Do you need to raise the camera slightly higher? Do you need to raise the camera slightly lower? Um, all these things can change, you know, so I think some kind of user guide, some kind of idea about the questions you should be asking, what equipment you should be using in terms of deployment methods and, and frames um, and, and, and how to, you know, step by step guide is, is, is something that I think would be incredibly beneficial because, you know, if you look at the agencies and, uh, it, it, you know, there's quite a high turnover of field staff going through the agencies. So if you, you look at somebody who's in the environment agency or an IFCA and they're quite new to it, they are quite often stuck out in the field with some kit and told to go and get some data um, with perhaps not sufficient experience, knowledge or training. Um, so we need to address that because it would massively improve and speed up the uh, analysis. Um, a lot of time and money is wasted on the analysis because the data is rubbish. Um, or not rubbish, but not as good as it could be. Um, and that also links to, um, you know, navigation files, video overlays, um, how we geo-reference everything. That, 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 those same parts need to be included um, in the acquisition side. Very, very important stuff, in my opinion. Um, and I think finally, how we're going to do the analysis. If in future you're going to be doing the analysis using Bigel, then you know lasers are going to be really important. How you set up your lasers is going to be important. So understanding all the different steps um, and what you want to achieve helps you helps you know how to set it up and 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 uh, and, uh, and deploy it and operate it. Um, so yeah, focus away from how fancy your kit is and, and, and a focus on how you use it and how you set it up. And I think for deep sea it's different, but for shallow water it's how you use your boat and who, who drives the boat. And we always drive our boat, we never drift. Um, drifting is, 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 but you know, quite often you get a lot of boat skippers that won't drift, that won't drive their boat with a camera at the back because they think it might get snagged or something. But it, it, the, the data quality you get is fundamentally different, um, a driven boat versus a drifted boat. Um, the small things, but um, they make a huge difference. Thank you. Um, I've got Ross had his hand up as well. Um, I think, and there's a bit of chat going on in the chat box as well. Yeah, I, I'll be quick now, Kirsten, because Steve's, <laughs> Steve's very probably much more succinctly than I was going to have hit a lot of the points I wanted to make. So thank you, Steve. Um, 
a couple of things. One, I wanted to absolutely echo two things. It's it's how you use it, not just what the kit is. There's a really big thing in there that uh, Kerry, someone said, you know, we need to think like photographers. That's That's been my biggest, aside of my megapixel soapbox, it's my photography soapbox I've been on for the last three and a half, four years in CFAS. Um, we need to get people thinking like photographers. I'm not going to say any more on that right now. Um, something Mark said, in addition to Hank, your note about other environmental variables, turbidity, altimetry, all of those things. The other thing that's incredibly useful, especially going back to the question about should we be concerned about megapixels in monitoring and comparing time against time? Um, the other thing that, in my opinion, we should be recording alongside all of the imagery that's collected is those environmental variables, but also just, you know, was the analyst having a good day? You know, and if the analyst can be recording, you know, I'm having a good day, that was easy. I'm having a bad day, that was really difficult. That can be really useful later on. So there's little things like that. And there was something Mark said in the chat a minute ago that I wanted to go back to that I've now completely forgotten. So, uh, oh no, I think that was, Mark was making that same point. I think that's it, I'll shush. All right, thank you. Um, I can still see Jamie Davis hand up. I'm not sure if that's a new one or if mine's is just not refreshing. No, um, sorry, I forgot to turn it off. All good. A um, lot of discussion in the chat regarding pretty much everything, to be honest. Um, environmental variables, um, camera resolutions. Um, I'll just... I can't see any more. Oh, Hank, Hank, you've oh, got your hand up now. I've, <laughs> uh, I've just popped it up because we're almost at the end of the session now. Um, and um, you, you realise just from the amount of conversation around the acquisition approaches that it's something close to everyone's heart, really. There's an awful lot to say about it. And um, just bringing things to a close on the acquisition side, um, what I've got so far that that it sounds like what we would like is some sort of central place where we can put what we've got sort of so if so you know as chris was saying they've got a system and they're doing a bit of work you know for part of project there could be sort of a low cost camera review kind of um uh, information coming out of that you know as um uh, you know some of the things that some of the other speakers has, have been saying as well um you know perhaps just a place to put these things where people can see them and get a copy of them um could could address could go part of the way to addressing some of those tasks um that 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 sounds like that's one kind of thing um okay there are other issues with getting that central place <laughs> Um, the Teams platform we use currently can be that central place, but the access hasn't been 100% perfect. But um, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is, um, with regards to the project working group, it sounds like there are enough people interested in, in, in the need, at least, for a project working group in this area. Um, how, we, how we decide um, how that's formed, it's quite a democratic process. But it does begin with you putting your hand up and you don't have to do it now, um, but um, have a think about it. And and if you if you would like to be involved in that trying to trying to move things f forward, please do uh, send a message into the big picture group um, email address. And um, and uh, yeah, you know, well, we can take that from there. We can put all of you, group all of you guys who are interested together and um you can s set yourselves off on a course um and begin to sort of mop up some of these ideas and thoughts uh, yep so i'll just put the email address in the chat again just in case anyone is missing it um hasn't seen it over the past couple of days but thank you very much to all of our speakers um, I'll let everyone get away for their lunch now. <laughs> uh, the networking channel will still be running uh, in the background, so if anyone does want to hop in there for like a chat with anyone, then please feel free. 